So now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Jay Maddock is a co-director of the Center for Health and Nature, a joint initiative of Texas A&M University, Houston Methodist Research Institute, and Texan by Nature. He is a professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at Texas A&M. Um, <clears throat> he previously served as the chair of the Hawaii Board of Health and Dean of the Texas A&M School of Public Health. His PhD is in experimental psychology from the University of Rhode Island. His research is focused on psychological policy and environmental health behavior change for physical activity, nutrition, and spending time in nature. His research has been featured in several national and international media outlets, including the Today Show, the BBC, Le Monde, Eating Well, Prevention, and Good Housekeeping. And he has authored over 130 scientific articles and has served as principal investigator on over 18 million in extramural funding. Please let's welcome Dr. Jay Maddock. Jay, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Appreciate the kind introduction. And uh, just going to share my screen here and we can jump into this. And here we go. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite things today, and that's how uh, we get more nature uh, in our practices with our patients uh, and for ourselves. And this journey for me started about eight years ago uh, on the Jeju Island in South Korea. I got invited to be the keynote speaker at the World Trails Conference, and I've been a physical activity researcher. And as I put my talk together. I found this, you know, kind of small body of literature related to the improvement of uh, human health when we spend time in nature. And then I got there and I gave this talk to all of these people that ran some of the world's largest trails, the Appalachian Trail, the Horn of Africa, uh, the Tasmanian Trail. And they were the happiest people I have ever met. I've never went to a conference where everyone was smiling and laughing and enjoying themselves. I'm like, wow. They spend the majority of their time in nature. There's got to be something to this. And so I've been a you know, physical activity, nutrition, obesity researcher. I think we've all seen the statistics, right? We know that uh, obesity has been rapidly increasing since the 1970s. We also know that we've had these deaths of despair uh, skyrocketing. Uh, opioid death, alcohol, suicide um, throughout the nation. And, and what you know, that says that. We, as we expect, healthcare costs are increasing too, right? Something's wrong in our society. You know, when we have something that, that's just not working right. And when, when I look at that, you know, from a, from a public health standpoint, we look at the ecological model. And we said, you know, it tends not to be individual forces that drive the society level outcome changes, but rather the social structure, policy, community level outcomes that are really driving this type of change. And so I started thinking and saying, you know, what's been changing? And this is a, a slide looking at time spent in major media in the U.S. And, and obviously, 2022 is is uh, projected, but you can see the time that we spent between 2018 and 2021 increasing by an hour a day spent on media, uh, from about six hours a day to eight. I actually have another slide, same same group that took us back to 2012. We were spending four hours a day in digital media. Now we spend eight. So we were spending this amazing amount of time in front of screens. And we so certainly the pandemic didn't help that. It only escalated it uh, faster. We also have become an urbanized nation. If we look back at the turn of the um, 20th century, um, we had about only 40% in urban locations and 60% in rural. And today it's over 80% of our populations are in urban. So we've become an urbanized nation with very few people living in rural areas anymore. So then we look at this data, the nature of Americans, and we look at how much time do Americans report spending outside uh, each week. And we find that you know, it's, it's only about half of Americans spend more than five hours a week outdoors. So five hours a week, you're thinking that's less than an hour a day. So we've totally removed ourselves from the natural environment 
unless we're purposeful of putting ourselves into nature, we spend all of our time inside, removed from, from that. And why is that a problem? Well, E.O. Wilson, who just passed away, um, has a hypothesis called the bio, biophilia hypothesis. And he pretty much said the innate emotional connection between human beings and other living organisms. So human beings were meant to be in nature. And we're, when, when we're removed from nature, bad things happen. And I think the, the easiest way for me to look at one study encapsulates, I think, the most powerful piece of this. High residential exposure to green spaces was associated with an 8% lower risk of all cause mortality. So if you live in a neighborhood with a lot of green spaces, you are much less likely to die, period. Nature is such a powerful uh, healthcare delivery system and yet we get so little of it. So luckily, you know, I came here to Texas from Hawaii and we had some visionary leadership that got together. So um, Mark Boone, the CEO of Houston Methodist, uh, First Lady Laura Bush from Texan by Nature, and uh, my boss, uh, John Sharp, the chancellor of the Texas A&M system, coming together and saying, we need a place where we have uh, research that goes into the healing effect of natural environments. And so along with my co-director, Vita Cash, I've been uh, very lucky to serve as the co-director for the last couple of years of this center where we really are trying to drive the research base, uh, both to show the connection between nature and human health, but also to get more people into nature, which is one of the main reasons we're here today. And so we started asking these questions and they're funny questions at first, you know, what is nature? You know, it's one of those things you think, oh, of course we know what nature is. But I think you could argue that both of these pictures depict nature, but on very different scales and very different levels. And as we start looking at it, we start looking at, well, there's, there's things like frequency. How often can I get into nature? The everyday stuff, a plant in my office is everyday, but it's small scale, right? Large scale are things like being in the wilderness, being, um, you know, taking a long weekend and getting into a national park. Uh, and so how do these have different effects on our health and what type how much nature do we need in what dose uh, and when is such a, you know, such how many of the unanswered questions right now. The other things you wouldn't even think is what about our senses? If we go and we walk in a forest, uh, all of our senses are engaged, right? We, we hear the, the wind rustling through the trees. We see all the beautiful things. We, we might touch uh, the leaves. Certainly we can feel the, um, the leaves and the pine needles under our feet. We don't have to make too much tasting, but you know we can have that that through our mouth, and then of course the smell of of uh, the trees is amazing. But are one more than important than the other? And and there's a question: Is can virtual nature actually replace actual nature in some circumstances, or it may be difficult? Like a person who lives in the inner city, or in a study that we ran as part of our center, uh, when we have cancer patients getting therapies. So we actually tested out um, the, the effect of virtual reality versus a green room versus a, a control room on um, patients uh, during an infusion and found that it was really well, you know, well tolerated and accepted. And we saw changes in blood pressure and heart rate and stress levels, uh, even in a virtual reality environment. So it says that both virtual and actual nature seem to have a positive effect uh, in this environment. So this work starts back um, in the 80s. Uh, Roger Ehrlich was an, actually a faculty member here at Texas A&M and did the seminal work in this area. And simple, simple study, he took patients in a hospital room that either had a view of a parking lot or a view of trees and grass. And he found those with a natural view through their windows, recovered faster, spent less time in the hospital, less painkillers, less post-op complications pretty amazing effect from just having a window view uh, versus not having one. So that work has continued and a lot of my uh, architects uh, for health friends do, do a lot of this work and looked at the effect of daylight on patients. If patients get daylight, they have less pain and stress and use of pain medications. Uh, some preliminary research looking at hospital gardens, eliminating stress in both patients and their families. Uh, and then facility design, the way that we can actually get people to access nature pain, stress, anxiety, blood pressure, heart rate. So numerous studies in the hospital environment looking at the effect of nature and better health outcomes. This though is much more recent, it's, it's 2019. 
uh, a study published in Nature looked at the effect of spending time in natural environments. And you can see both for the top one, which is uh, overall good, very good health, and the second one, which is well-being, um, that we see an effect around two hours. So you only need about two hours a week to see these kind of self-reported effects um, in, in, from being out in nature uh, per week. So then we, you know, the question is, okay, we're seeing these studies, we see these effects. What, um, how does nature actually um, affect health? So this this model was published just a couple of years ago. You see, most of this research is extremely recent, uh, and they hypothesized there was three pathways through which we improved health: reducing harm, restoring capacities, and building capacities. So if we do a look at reducing harm, uh, our green space have a direct effect on improving our environment. Green spaces have lower air pollution levels in urban areas and may remove particulate matter. Uh, urban green spaces also reduce heat island effects, which we know here in Texas is super important, and reduce noise levels by 5 to 10 decibels, supplying psychologically benefit, beneficial natural sounds. And green infrastructure can increase flooding during hurricanes and other storm events. So certainly um, we have the, the really visible ones. We've been working with the city of Houston on some green infrastructure solutions around bioswales to reduce the effect of flooding events, but also to do infills for urban nature. Um, and this is seen, you know, is getting into the popular press. This is an article that uh, published in the New York Times back in August to measure uh, inequality, map the trees in a city. And they found clearly that, that urban neighborhoods have less or Low income urban neighborhoods have less trees than high affluent urban neighborhoods. And we can certainly think about places in Dallas and in Houston where, where that is the case. And why is this important? Well, this is a study that was done in the not so seamy city of, of Toronto, Canada, uh, where they looked at during a heat wave uh, where did the emergency calls come from and what was the level of tree canopy coverage? And you can see in here the density of calls were much higher in low canopy areas than they were in high canopy areas. And Toronto is interesting because most people are not going to have uh, built in central air conditioning, right? And so this is a place where we don't have air conditioning. It's hotter in places where we don't have, uh, don't have tree cover. And we've done some work with our College of Architecture looking at microclimates. And so uh, one thing we know here in Texas is we love football. And we love having games in August and September. Well, if you looked at the effect of artificial turf, um, it tends to be extremely hot compared to natural grass. And so one thing is we we work with uh, with architects and environmental planners is heat is one of the biggest reasons people do not access nature in Texas in the summer. And so how do we design microclimates that are green that are going to reduce the heat uh, effects so that people can spend time out in nature? The second area is restoring capacities. Uh, nature not only reduce, reduces stress, but it improves attention. It actually has the ability to reset our attention. So we've looked in uh, office workers and students, giving them a break during the day to spend 15, 20 minutes in a natural environment. And when they come back, they have a tree time on task, attention to detail, improved cognitive functioning, and then improvements in creative tasks have also been demonstrated. So people tend to think more outside the box when they've had a, a dose of nature. This is a little bit older study, but looking at just bringing some urban dwellers um, out to a natural environment for a long weekend. They found less mental fatigue, less irritability and accidents, increased problem solving and increased concentration. So spending a weekend uh, in nature can make a huge difference uh, throughout, throughout the week. This is a, a study designed looking at that attention restoration theory and kind of how we've done this in school for bringing kids out and saying, okay, here's free play in the natural environment versus free play in the gym. And then the kids do better on uh, these tests of um, tests of attention and creativity. It's really I mean, it's amazing for that little half hour of where the kids spend their recess. And then finally, looking at the area of building capacities is not only can nature restore us, but it can also promote health by encouraging physical activity, improving relationships in our communities. And certain types of green space, parks, uh, walking, hiking trails, green schoolyards, have been found to improve physical activity and increase its benefits. So it's actually the synergistic effect. We had just had a paper come out, look at physical activity alone, looking at nature alone, 
And when we put them together, we actually have better than either of the two of them alone, which is fantastic. And green spaces also can increase social cohesion. So I know social isolation has been a huge problem. Um, and so many people took to exercising outdoors in nature during the pandemic. So if we look at some of, of the research, we find that people that exercise in wooded environments have a, a lower risk, odds ratio of 0.55 of poor mental health than those in natu non-natural environments. And you can increase this attention directed ability just by taking a walk uh, in a forested area. These are cool. They're, they've been putting these in, in certain places where they, they take the playground. You think of so many playgrounds, like concrete, sterile environments. Uh, and they've started building in um, green space around the, the playground. It actually acts as a great barrier. Instead of putting up a fence, you put up those, those thorny um, uh, green plants and kids aren't gonna run through them, run into the street. So you don't need that iron chain link fence instead. And it increases physical activity and decreases sedentary time. And there are fewer fights. I mean, not something I would have expected just from putting a green environment in the place that you get less fights from doing that. So this is a study that I ran a couple of years ago, and we looked at leisure time physical activity in public parks and in diverse communities. Um, so my colleague Myron Floyd and I went to about 25 parks in Chicago and 25 parks in Tampa in um, predominantly white, black, and Hispanic communities. And we looked at, at who was there in the physical activity. This was physical activity studies. So this is one of our Chicago parks. And this is one of our Tampa parks. And you can tell based on the built environment, uh, that we had a, a difference in sedentary behaviors. 70% of people were sedentary in Tampa compared to 51% sedentary in Chicago. Now, again, I collected this before my lens was on nature. So then I did a lot of work in China, uh, actually in Wuhan, which is another story in and of itself. But uh, this, this study occurred in a, in a city called Nanchung, which is about the same size as Chicago. We went out and did the same protocol and the same number of observations in parks, and we observed 75,000 people in the parks in, in Nanchung compared to only 5,000 in Chicago. And more than half of the park users were older adults compared to less than 10% in the U.S. So I've, I've written in several places, uh, really, do we need to design parks for older adults? Um, because we tend to design parks for teenagers and for little children. And how do we get Americans to use parks more? Go by any park uh, around and what do you see? It tends to be empty. I can drive around College Station right now, especially during the school day, and parks are gonna be empty. It's this great space that we have that people tend not to utilize. This is my favorite study. Um, this is a study uh, of forest bathing. And forest bathing is kind of, uh, you go out into, into nature, you're led by a guide, you do some mindfulness uh, activities to really appreciate uh, the wind on your face and the smell and, and other things. So they took a group of people, this was done in Japan, out for a three-day, two-night trip to a forest, and they took a, a control group um, to a, a city environment. And they found this increase in uh, natural killer cell activity. Uh, and you can see it happened at day one and day two while they were in the forest. But what's amazing is that day seven and at day 30, uh, their natural killer cell activity was higher than it was at baseline. So just by spending one weekend in the forest, we get this increase in immuno function that lasts uh, a month later. So really an incredible study on the power and effect of nature. The other group we've been working with is the, uh, the um, Houston, Parks, uh, uh, Houston Parks Board. And they've been working on the Bayou Greenway uh, Program, which is 150 miles of trails, 3,000 acres of green space uh, in this $220 million public-private partnership. So we worked with them. We said, you know, we'd love to see the effect uh, retrospectives. They've been doing this for about 10 years now. Does it actually affect uh, hospitalizations in the areas near the Greenway Trails? And we found that it does. We looked at zip codes with 30% or more of the population living within a 10-minute walk of one of the Bayou Greenway trails. They had a 93% reduction in obesity-related emissions, 77% uh, reduction in heart disease emissions, and 71% in heart attacks. So a really incredible effect of just having access to a Bayou Greenway trail uh, within your community. 
So as we look at a lot of the preventative effects and kind of this is getting into how did physicians uh, prescribe uh, nature to, to their patients? And hopefully you know, I've sold you now on the importance of nature. Uh, can it actually help keep us healthy? So there's this forest bathing. So um, there are guides now that are trained that we can bring people out into nature. In Scotland, um, nature prescriptions are reimbursable. And so they put out these educational leaflets with monthly activities, touching the ocean, taking a, a dog for a walk, following a bumblebee, and um, practicing different nature things throughout. In the UK, they have a 30-day wild program. This encourages people to engage with nature every day um, for a month. And they had 18,000 people sign up in the first year, which still, you know, compared to the size of the UK, is, is a drop in the bucket, but it's getting there. I think we're getting this recognition of how important nature is to health. And um, I'll talk uh, uh, in a couple of seconds on Park RX America, but that's really been uh, the effort in this country um, to do nature prescriptions. Uh, one final thing that I want to talk about before I jump into some of the programs is, is the, some of the healing garden work that we've done. So we've been working uh, with Houston Methodist. Uh, we've been using our uh, landscape architecture students to do their studios at Methodist. So it's a great partnership between uh, A&M and Methodist to give students real world projects, but also this ability to build what healing gardens should look like and how we actually work best with the patients. And so. We will have, I believe now, two healing gardens going into uh, Houston Methodist, and they're planned in a way that not only will they be accessible, and there'll be projects like aquaponics and gardening and uh, a variety of other uh, mindfulness classes held in the gardens, but that the most ill patients who are not mobile will have views of uh, the gardens from their hospital room, and so really a way to provide nature, um, you know, really that full circle back back to the early studies that were done. So we have an amazing panel today, and we uh, have the founder with us uh, of Walk by a Doc. Well, I'm sorry, Walk with a Doc, which is uh, a walking program that physicians and, and other healthcare professionals can lead. And he will give you much more information on that. But I think it's such an incredible uh, way to connect with your patients and also connect your patients uh, to nature. And then, as I mentioned, Park RX America, and we have uh, a representative today who. Uh, has been implementing this in Utah, but really it allows uh, physicians to prescribe nature, and this has been doing, going done throughout the country. It doesn't always need to be physicians, because obviously these are, are not uh, pharmaceutical uh, interventions, and so we're actually starting a chapter here of Nature RX, uh, Nature Campus RX, so Texas A&M. It will be one of uh, more than 30 campuses that are encouraging nature among their students, uh, faculty, and staff. So I want to thank everybody for their attention. Um, I am excited to uh, join this fantastic panel that we have today and really dive into some of these uh, message methods in a, a more Q&A format. So let me stop sharing my screen. Jay, thank you so much. I, I really, truly appreciate uh, your presentation and, and this overview. Uh, it's uh, you know, a, a lot of great information and I'm just going to comment before I introduce our panel members uh, uh, that, you know, this is important for self care too. as physicians, as nurses, as frontline providers, as advanced practice professionals, you know. Just a few moments out in nature could make a huge difference for all of us. So. Jay, again, thanks. Thanks for this uh, presentation. Listen, it is my honor to introduce our panel. Uh, uh, panelists, if you would uh, unmute your phones and also turn on your video so I can begin the introductions. First one is uh, Jody Carswell. Jody is the president uh, of Texan by Nature and its CEO, where she is responsible for leading the mission to bring business and conservation together. She's a graduate of the Kellogg School of Management with a master's in business administration and also Northwestern McCormick School of Engineering with a master's in engineering management. Sarah Kennison uh, earned her bachelor's degree in public health from um, Brigham Young University, Idaho, and recently received her master's of public health through the Utah State University. Sarah currently serves as the Healthy Living Health Educator for Salt Lake County Health Department 
and has served as the program manager of Parks Prescription Utah for the last three years. And finally, uh, Dr. David uh, Sabgur, he is a practicing cardiologist in Columbus, Ohio. And as Jay mentioned, he's also the founding CEO of Walk with a Doc. This is an international nonprofit with over 600 chapters in more than 40 different countries with a mission of inspiring communities through movement and conservation. So welcome panelists. I, I truly appreciate all of this. Uh, I will remind our participants, please submit any questions that you have uh, in the chat function and we can start uh, discussing these. But uh, Jay, let me start off by just asking um, you a question as well. What are some of the biggest research questions around health and nature that still need to be answered? Sure, you know, I think it's really an interesting level is we're trying to figure out dose. And so we saw that at two hours a week does something. And we saw that the weekend in nature is important for your, your natural killer cells. What we don't know a lot about is how do we actually um, tailor uh, levels of recommendation, right? How much should a, a child be getting? I'm assuming, I would assume that children should be getting a lot more nature than adults, but we don't, we don't know about that. We don't know uh, if there's difference between men and women we don't know the differences between the virtual nature and the actual nature so there are so many different ways that we need to keep we know nature is good for you <laughs> and more seems to be better but we're really trying to dig in and figure out uh just exactly how, how can we give a recommendation like we would with fruits and vegetables or physical activity fantastic comment from any of the panelists i just want to thank uh Jay, for really a great presentation. I love the comments about synergy of walking and doing it in nature, you know, some better than its parts. And um, I think it's fascinating on the Bayou Greenway trails, drove through Houston this past summer and uh, exciting to see that all that construction is gonna be paying off so, so nicely. Thank you, David. Uh... Sarah, you know, I was going to ask you a question too. You've been you've been the program manager for the last three years uh, of the Parks Prescription uh, program. Uh, what strategies are you using to to really help health systems engage with the community and other key stakeholders? Yeah, so uh, for the last three years, we've really been trying to engage our providers in the state and. Uh, we first implemented the program actually in the worksite wellness realm. And so that gave us a lot of good um, information that we needed so we can create a program for our providers because we want to make sure that when we're engaging our um, clinics um, that they have a program that can, they can easily implement. So the way that we're engaging our partners is a lot of networking, um, making sure we're giving the resources that our clinics need. So we are currently working on our scripting and our evaluation measures that we want our clinics to gather, as well as any other resources that they, they may need or as well as their patients. And we um, actually just had a focus group with our provide some providers in throughout uh, Utah to really learn from them what their needs are and how we can really tailor a park prescription program in their clinic better. And so uh, we're still in the process and we're still learning, but um, we're gonna have a lot of great information in this next year. Listen, that sounds fantastic. Could you elaborate just a little bit more on perhaps what evaluation measures could clinics get from our patients? Yes, so we are asking our clinics to gather, of course, those um, clinical measures like um, weight, blood pressure, um, A1C levels if the patients are di um, diabetic, as well as we really want to collect data about mental health because, as it was mentioned, and a lot of the data that's out there, it's really revolving around mental health and the improvement of um, anxiety and depression disorders. And so we want to ask questions about that as well as health behavior questions because uh, we want this to be a sustainable. Um, 
program and sustainable behavior in patients' lives. And so we're hoping to see um, an improvement in health behavior. So we're asking the clinics to ask a couple questions revolving health behavior when it comes to patients going outside. Yeah, listen, that's, uh, that's amazing. You're so right about uh, mental health and behavioral health. Uh, a parks prescription is probably one of the cheapest things that we could do long term. Right, and that's why we want to um, implement this program in Utah, just because it is a, an affordable option to getting um, to improving physical and mental health. David, it's been great to, to, to have you join us and really appreciate this. Uh, I, I, there's so many questions I could ask you as well, too, but I, it, just give we have a chapter here. It's a very active chapter as well, but can you tell us how, how was that started? How, how did you come up with walk with a doc? Well, um, I don't have uh, Jay's wisdom for nature uh, to not have that. We stumbled into that and I'm so glad we did. Um, as far as the origin story of walk with a doc, I hate to say it was born out of frustration. I had spent my internship residency and fellowship hearing how People, my patients really genuinely wanted to get out and be active, but it's six and 12 month follow ups. My success rate was probably 2%, even though the conversations were really fruitful. So I wanted the patient to have to say no to my face and make it awkward and hard for them. And that's how it all started. Fantastic. Uh Listen, before I go to the chat, and I see several comments in here already, I, I wanted to reach out to you, Joni, just real quickly. In your opinion, what are some of the biggest barriers to adoption of these nature-based programs for health? And what can we do to, uh, to address these? Yeah, so I think that Jay and David and, and Sarah, to an extent, all head on these, right? Um, so David talked about his frustration of, like, here's all the data and the evidence, but at the end of the day, it was a behavior that they needed to change. And it wasn't as easy as picking up a pill and, and taking it. It was something that would take a little bit of effort. And so he put a program in place to make people say no to his face that, you know, he was going to get them out there and walk. And likewise, Sarah is putting behavioral change, behavioral incentives in place to change behaviors. So I think behavior is a big barrier. And then Jay hit a lot on it as far as dosage. We don't know, we know nature is good, but it makes it more difficult when you can't say 30 minutes or one hour. And so there's still some work to be done to um, gather that research and that data. Um, you know, prove that it's conclusive and then uh, distribute that to all of the relevant parties who would be prescribing that and then moving into that behavioral change piece of it. Because if you look at any of the public health type issues over the last decades, whether it was changing our, our behavior around smoking, changing our behavior around walking and physical activity, there's always this and if you have to reach that mountaintop of data and research that's available, and then you have to put behavioral and incentive programs in place to actually have prescriptions and activity and people uh, adopting the changes. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, those are great comments. I'm going to go to some of our chat. Uh, one of the first questions that came up, how can one get exposure to nature when living in metropolitan areas? And the second part to that, will an indoor green plant be of help? I can jump in on that. Uh, Please. Yeah, so nature is, it's amazing as we talked, you know, I talked a little bit about micro to macro doses. And so anywhere you can integrate nature can make a difference. You can put a natural scene on your screensaver and it will make a difference. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, I'll, I'll sit sitting right here and here's, here's my plant and uh, I can see uh, Dr. Ace plant behind him. Um, so, yeah, so integrating plants is, is one way to do it. Um, you know, we look a lot for um, micro nature in urban, urban areas and there are green spaces, uh, pocket parks, um, you know, I, I would say investigate your neighborhood and find out where the green spaces are 
And so, you know, we, we always look and I think we do problem solving with people and say, there are a lot of times there's green spaces that people don't recognize they're there, but any time spent in any form of nature is going to be good. Obviously, spending a weekend in the San Houston forest is going to be the top, but you can find that micro nature in a lot of places. And just to add on to that, I, I completely agree. Being more familiar with your city park systems, your state park system, your national park system, and even the offerings of various nature preserves and conservation groups, those are more prevalent than we realize even in Texas, which is 95 to 97% privately owned, depending on what statistic you look at, there is opportunity to get outside and onto areas to be immersed in nature. So just familiarizing um, yourself, whether it's trails, uh, all trails as an app that's going to show a lot of that information or becoming familiar with your city websites that provides where to go to be in nature. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. You know, I, I know even locally here and, and in the surrounding communities, there's been a lot of emphasis on developing local parks and everything else. And, uh, Unlike uh, in uh, Ohio, where it's zero degrees, you know, today would be a great day to go out and take a quick walk. You know, that would be fantastic. And uh, Sarah, I think even in Salt Lake City, you know, it, it may be zero, but it's always a great time to take a walk up in some of those parks there as well. Uh, let me see, there are other questions that I, I, I came through, what development has been done to design outdoor spaces for older adults? Yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's slow moving, but it's coming along. It's, I think you see a lot of um, nursing homes now have really realized the, the benefits of nature. And so um, I, I've been to some where they've done internal courtyards um, on the memory care area, right? So one of the big issues with people with, with um, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia is wandering, right? And so they, they were able to put courtyards inside so that people can enjoy nature and not leave. They've also put a lot of windows up so that you can enjoy nature and see it no matter what the weather is outside. So certainly senior care. The park stuff is interesting. I talked to the um, the BBC and there is a movement now in uh, the UK to start senior parks. Um, this would be parks specifically designed for Older adults um, that would have, you know, water features and benches and nice trees and not have playgrounds and basketball courts and things that, that really bring teenagers win because of safety concerns and issues. Um, so it's slow going, but there are definitely are some movements that are starting to percolate up. So we're, we're seeing progress on the urban trail front in that area too. So great examples are the Paso del Norte Trail in El Paso, where it's flat, it's navigable, there are benches, but there are also points of interest, um, historical and cultural markers, uh, co conservation information. So it's, you can walk a little bit, you can learn a little bit, and it's a flatter, easier to navigate path. Same with the High Line in New York. Um, you're seeing more and more of these opportunities to get outside in urban areas where it's just more interesting and um, accessible for our older populations, even outside of um, nursing homes and care facilities. Another question that has come through uh, uh, panelists is that, are any of you aware of any efforts to partner with mental health agencies to provide services in nature? Uh, so here in uh, Utah for our program, Parker X Utah, we actually have a work group specifically um, for mental health because we have a major, I mean, as it is in the, um, the entire country, but in Utah, particularly, we have a major mental health crisis. And so we are working right now with a lot of our local agencies and we're hoping to get park prescriptions or outdoor prescriptions, any kind of prescription to get outside early into those mental health offices, because it is very really important um, at the national level. We're not, um, but it's definitely if there is an organization at the city or the county level where you're at about um, prescribing outdoor time, then that is definitely something that should be an area of focus and reaching out to whatever organizations are around you. There, there are quite a few nonprofits um, focused in that space as well. 
Um, one in particular that comes to mind is Rivers of Recovery. So it's a veteran focused organization that is pairing, pairing uh, mental health and PTSD issues and getting veterans outside and into nature. And then there are several other veteran focused organizations that create, create communities in the outdoor like Team RWBE, uh, our, uh, Team RWB, excuse me, and then also um, Camp Southern Ground are doing outdoor programs um, targeted at mental health. Another question that has come through, uh, have issues of personal safety in urban park settings been part of the benefit analysis? Is there accounting for extremes of weather in certain climates? particularly for the elderly. See, I could probably take, take some of those. Um, yeah, we've certainly looked at safety issues in, in parks. I think that's, it, it, it's a major issue, um, but it's actually, you know, we've mostly found that, that parks tend to be fairly safe. There tends to be a lot of uh, uh, eyes on the ground, they tend to actually be built in ways that, that you can see across and, and we tend not to have as much more, actually more wooded areas where we have issues, um, than parks. And so by greenways, that's something that we are looking at, um, because, you know, it does kind of go in and out of the bayous. Um, so the, yes, that's an issue. And I think, especially in lower income communities, we're looking at, at that and sort of the, the perceived and actual, uh, safety risks as, as an important feature connected to nature. And then the the extreme weather, yeah, I think it's, in particular what I mentioned was looking at the microclimates around heat. And that tends to be the, you know, the, the biggest persistent uh, negative weather that we have in Texas, right? It's, it's hot all summer. And we know natural environments are cooler, but they're also can be designed in ways that they, they are actually substantially cooler. And so, uh, I was in Houston last August. We were going to a couple of different sites, and there were some that were particularly, even there were all green sites, but some were, you know, 10, you could feel 10 degrees cooler depending on where you were. And so we're looking at how we, we do better design principles to make sure that, that they, they are done in ways that, that reduce the effect of, of heat. Comments from anyone else regarding this particular topic or questions? Set of questions. Yeah, on, on the safety side, we actually heard a wonderful speaker by the name of Jennifer Roberts talk about some of the mental barriers to getting out and into nature. And a lot of times the perception of safety is actually not reality, but that's a real barrier and a barrier to a behavioral change. And so as you're thinking about you know, whether you're a park group or a healthcare system, as you're thinking about lighting and even thinking about messaging your outdoor space and getting people to utilize your prescription program or your space a little bit more, understanding that a large portion of the population has fear around being outside and exposed in nature, that is something that needs to be addressed from an education perspective, just as much from the actual lighting and safety measures that are put in place um, as well. And Jennifer, Dr. Roberts gave some excellent data around that and just that perception piece of safety. Yeah, that's interesting. One of the comments uh, here was about, about safety uh, and related to uh, uh, perhaps uh, dangerous animals, snakes, and other things of that nature. So, you know, it's just something, again, to be aware of and uh, uh, just, uh, just to provide education, you know. Sarah, I know we've talked about other things as well too, but uh, how have how has your program been able to address equity issues? Is that a, is that a problem? Yes, I mean it's a problem everywhere, and uh, we so for like I mentioned earlier, one of the greatest reasons why we want to implement a park prescription program in the state of Utah is uh, because it's free. Because that's a major barrier to why people don't. Uh, exercise in general. And so that's one of the biggest things when it comes to equity, but also we are addressing those things like safety in parks. One park might be safer than a park um, in a different zip code, or one park might have a 
walking path where one doesn't. And so we are addressing that. And then also we recently conducted a study with minority populations here in the state of Utah, just to understand their perceptions and the barriers that they experience as well as um, safety. And so really trying to understand um, where we can fit in and then taking that information and then connecting to our partners that have the power to improve parks or provide that education as what um, Joni mentioned. Um, and so we don't take it all on ourselves, but we do connect to our different partners throughout um, the state of Utah and really engaging the community. That's where it um, really boils down to is really understanding our population and making sure that they have ownership um, over their surrounding areas and that they feel comfortable and they have an equitable opportunity to be outside. Fantastic. Thank you. David, I wanted to turn back a bit to walk with a doc. You know, I've been trying to learn more about the program. I've been a participant there. I've actually uh, led some of the sessions there, but. You know, looking at it, you mentioned there's 4 foundations to walk with a doc. Could you could you expand on those a little bit? David, I think you're still on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. A for. Uh, lending your talents to our humble organization. We're very grateful. Um, the four, you know, the obvious uh, physical activity and nature, um, as well as um, education and then social connection. And that, you know, the social connection comes into play with many, um, many different areas, but as we we're talking about with safety. And as we surveyed our participants every year, walking in a group, um, there's the, the comfort of conversation and all those wonderful chemicals like serotonin that we get when we're also engaged in conversation. But safety, safety is a part of that. And um, another reason I'm so grateful to Dr. Maddock and his colleagues is it, it's a great opportunity to put science behind um, nature and, and why it is so good and we all feel good and, and why is that? That's important to us as, as we move forward. Thank you so much. You know, David, just thinking about walk with the doc too, you know, the question has come in, how do I get involved with that? You know, how do I get engaged? And, I'll just tell you now, you can reach out to me directly. You can reach out to Natalie. Our marketing department uh, is fully aware of this. Brenda Walleen is fully aware of it. If you're looking for a chapter to join, let us know. We'll find it. Uh, Baylor Scott and White Health has worked closely with the Texas Medical Association. We're working hard to uh, promote Walk with a Doc uh, throughout uh, not only the Baylor Scott and White uh, healthcare system, but throughout the state of Texas as well. So. Uh, I do think that's uh, that's a wonderful opportunity. And David, perhaps you could comment too. What's the typical doc that signs up to lead a program or to lead a walk? Yeah, first yeah. let me say you're exactly right. The TMA has been an incredible partner now for nearly 10 years. And any doc in Texas who wants to do the program, it's free. It's included as part of your membership in the TMA. So that's Part of the reason we have 75 sites throughout your great state. Um, typically, uh, you know, I thought first, Dr. A, it would be primary care docs, but it turns out the number one draw would be physicians that either are into physical fitness or motivated to be outside, uh, docs who already you know, uh, see the power of nature and be at a family medicine physician or a pathologist or a radiologist or plastic surgeon, it really runs the gamut. Thank you so much. Um, Jay, you know, I, I wanted to uh, just ask you too, you know, we've talked about the parks prescription. Where would I go to find more information about this? Can, can you share a source for us? We can even post it on our, our SharePoint site. 
Sure. Parks and Recs of America is uh, got all the resources that you need to start your own park prescription program. Fantastic. We will we'll get that posted on our website. Another question is just come. How would I get, or how would a patient get to participate in a walk with a doc? And again, I think we can answer that, but, but comments from, from you guys, anybody, how do we get patients involved? Yeah. So, um, as you said, Dr. A, if you go to walk with a doc.org, we have a team that is, uh, I'm blessed with an incredible team. So we will get back with you right away. That's the easiest thing. If you don't already have a chapter in your community, reach out to us. We've got those resources developed where we can give you the tools to help bring that about. If the closest walk with a doc is too far of a drive to for you. Well, colleagues, we are coming close to the uh, top of the hour. I wanted to just spend the final few minutes uh, and and perhaps ask the panelists if there's a final word from any of you. And uh, perhaps Sarah, if I may start with you, any final thoughts, comments? Of course. I mean, um, if my information could be shared with everyone, I'd be happy to provide any resources if clinics are interested. Uh, like it was mentioned, Parker X America is a wonderful resource. We use them. And so, um, if you're interested in using that database as well and wanting to see what it could look in an actual clinic, um, feel free to email me at skinnison at slco.org or even just reach out to us on our website, parkerxutah.org. Um, you can get a hold of me through there. And I'm happy to send any uh, clinical. Um, uh, let's see what the, the clinical, uh, I can't even think of the word resources. That's the word uh, clinical resources that you might be interested. Um, so feel free to reach out. Sarah, thanks for that offer. And, and again, uh, colleagues, those of you online, you can certainly reach out to me or my uh, administrative assistant, Natalie, and we'll get you in touch with Sarah as well. So Joni thoughts from you, ma'am. Absolutely. I think that, um, each of the three experts on this call touched on the partnership aspect of what they're doing. And just know if you're listening today and you're wondering how to get involved, you know, we've given good resources with Parks RX and Walk with a Doc and, and TMA is providing that. But know that you're not alone. There are healthcare systems, there are there's academia is involved, conservation groups are involved. There are already programs like Walk with a Doc and Parks RX that are available. So reach out, this is a perfect opportunity for collaboration of the groups that can provide access and education, the groups that can prescribe nature, the groups that can be the expert on the walks and, and create a groundswell of, of activity and action moving forward. So I think that we are in an excellent place with the sheer diversity of groups focused on getting people out in nature and reaping the benefits of that. So I encourage everyone to partner with those around them to, to make this happen a lot faster. Thank you, Joni. David, final thoughts, comments? Thank you. I just uh, sent Aloha Adventure as a, we have a wonderful partnership, uh, as you were saying, Joni, with um, Avocados, Love One Today. So we they are underwriting a free uh, virtual adventure, um, what Jay was saying about virtual images, hopefully some of that uh, relays, but we would say go for a walk for three miles and then you plug your data in and it'll move your avatar along the island of Hawaii, uh, the big island, and you can uh, get credit and meet others and we would encourage you to do that. and. Uh, Finally, a note of optimism, while there are certainly many doctors and um, allied healthcare providers not doing walk with a doc, and it's not a fit for everyone, there's over 880,000 physicians within the US and well over a million additional nurse practitioners and physician assistants. And we are able to capture a percentage of them and that any percentage of a number that big is going to create movement. So I think there's plenty of reason um, with the incredible work that Jay and Joni and Sarah and you are doing and 
all the efforts that this is this is um, catching, and I'm I'm really excited to see uh, in the next five seven years what comes from all this this fun work. David, I appreciate that, and and honestly, thanks for your vision for uh, being able to put walk with the doc, you know, together and 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 to see what it has become today. It's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Jay, I'm going to give you final comments. Basically, it's your right. sir. You. This is this has been so exciting. I think you know, I've been working in health promotion for over 20 years now and yeah, you know, I think it's we we always kind of had the same messages, be active, eat healthy, don't abuse substances. And now we have a new Thing to tell people to do that can improve their health. It's uh, free and low cost in most areas, and it really makes you feel incredibly well. It improves mental health and it reduces stress. And you know, if this was a pill, we'd be prescribing it to everybody, right? And so, you know, I, I, I'm excited about how nature can really change uh, the lives uh, of all of us. And so, thank you everyone for the, joining us today because it means a lot that people are excited about this and. Uh, and these great colleagues that are out there on the panel with me too. It's, just, it's great to see uh, this movement growing. Jay, thank you so much. And uh, again, I think you're absolutely right. And colleagues, those of you that are listening in on this conference, I think uh, this is one case where it's okay to write your own prescription <laughs> to one of the parks. So uh, uh, honestly, Jay, thank you so much for 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 being the lead presenter here. Uh, my colleagues, uh, you know, Sarah, Joni, David, uh, can't thank you enough for being panelists and sharing your expertise with all of us. Uh, I really appreciate this and uh, thank you for your time and all you do for um, patients and, and our overall health and wellness.